Hi, thanks for joining us today at the talk for the OpenEMP project and its working group. Uh, we're going to be talking about standardizing interactions between the operating environments in a heterogeneous embedded system. Uh, I'm Natalie, open source program manager working with Xilinx open source office. And my co-presenter is Stefano, who is system software architect and virtualization lead at Xilinx. Um, both of us were involved with the relaunch as a Linaro community project. So what are we going to cover today? So we'll talk about uh, what OpenAMP is trying to solve. We'll give you some information about what the project is and how this project that started with a repository of code and some interested collaborators grew into a more mature open source project with working groups that are now tackling a wider scope. We'll cover examples of OpenAMP in industry to give you an idea of the breadth of use cases and of participation. We'll point you to resources where you can learn more, and we will let you know how you can get involved. So I'm going to leave this slide up for a couple of seconds if you want to take a screenshot or a photo of it. These are the acronyms that we're going to be using later in the presentation. And Stefano will take it from here. Hi, everybody. Um, I would like to talk to you about uh, what kind of problems OpenAMP was born to solve. Nowadays, uh, system on chips, or SOCs in short, are becoming more and more complex, uh, more and more um, rich in terms of hardware resources, capabilities, and functionalities. So once upon a time, you typically had one cluster of CPUs, so a few CPU cores, and a bunch of devices. It's not like that anymore. So now, often you have more than one cluster of CPUs. So if we take as an example uh, the Xilinx and PSOC, we have a cluster with four Cortex-A cores, and then we have on the side a cluster with two Cortex-R cores. So these are both ARM cores, but actually they support different instruction sets, and they are very, very different uh, uh, CPUs. Uh, one focuses on real-time and small uh, application. The other one can support very rich OSs. Um, we can also have, we also have all other kind of cores. We have microblaze cores that are uh, not, you know, they're not uh, using an ARM instruction set at all, uh, and we have a lot of programmable logic. So you can um, deploy uh, multiple soft cores, as we say, so CPUs in programmable logic that can be microblades, it can be other CPUs too, like cortex -Ms. So in other words, um, an SOC of today, it looks a bit like a whole uh, data center on chip. So it, it, there are with many um, clusters of different, of very different cores running alongside. Um, some of them, like, uh, the Cortex-A cluster, which is the largest, uh, uh, with multiple execution levels. And very different software runs at each level. So you have user space, kernels, hypervisors, and um, secure world, um, uh, with multiple execution level as secure world two, with secure real zero, secure real one. Um, so this brings us a very rich ecosystem of software and operating system that needs to be uh, installed and run and coordinated. Uh, across across the SOC, um, so Linux is uh, uh, very important, on, especially on the Cortex A cluster. But it's not the only operating system uh, that runs. So you have Zephyr or FreeRTOS, other RTOSes on the Cortex R or the other smaller cores. Uh, you, bare metal application is still very popular and used. So little tiny application plus just enough functionalities to initialize uh, the system. Um, so uh, that give us really uh, um, a combination of, uh, uh, of firmware operating system, larger and smaller, real time and non-real time, that can be very complex to configure, coordinate, and, and make it work uh, together uh, in, in an efficient way. 
So typically, uh, people still, you know, without OpenAMP, there is really no solution for 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 deploying such and and managing such a complex system. Everybody is really hacking together uh, or you know coding together uh, the system as you can because it is really difficult. Uh, so there are a number of difficult problems to solve from uh, just you know the configuration to uh, you know resource management, lifecycle management, communication, uh, and more. And as you can see, all these problems, you, you know, they need to be solved with interfaces. So you cannot really just code away uh, the implementation uh, and, you know, expect it to be used by everybody. There are so many different communities, open source projects with different cultures, uh, proprietary vendors, so many component and pieces that they need to uh, communicate and come together to, uh, to make the system work. Um, and this is how OpenAMP was born, to, to, to solve this problem through uh, reference open source implementations uh, through common interfaces designed by the community and open standards. Um, and uh, by reference open source implementation, I mean that uh, the best possible way to uh, get a new, a new interface adopted quickly is to have a reference implementation that any, anybody can look at, see how it works, uh, and then uh, use it to as, as, as a reference for their own implementation in Linux, Zephyr, other OSs, really, or anywhere. And through the uh, proper documentation of these interfaces being introduced uh, and a proper management of, the, of, of, these, uh, of these interfaces, then you get to the point that you have a standard, a very strong standard that the community stands behind. So um, the and the vision for OpenAMP, in, 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 I'm going to read it out loud, is uh, for the OpenAMP project to seek to standardize interactions between operating environments in an heterogeneous embedded system through open source solution for asymmetric multiprocessing. This is really the condensed version, the summarized version of, uh, of uh, everything I said so far. So OpenAMP, uh, as um, Natalie mentioned in the beginning, started small, like all open source projects. Uh, it started uh, with a couple of repositories on uh, GitHub, um, the RP message and remote proc repositories. And they are for uh, to, to solve two of the very core problems that OpenAMP is trying to solve. Uh, RP message is a protocol based on Bert.io uh, for communication between um, clusters. And remote proc is for lifecycle management, so that one cluster can start the other. Uh, but OpenAMP is not is not just any uh, open source project. Like like uh, I mentioned, uh, the key of OpenAMP is really solving uh, the interaction between different components and the creation of standards through collaboration and and and, and community uh, discussions. So uh, since the beginning, OpenAMP uh, had meetings, regular meetings. Uh, a few uh, silicon vendors and other companies uh, working together uh, to make the vision uh, a success. Initially, OpenAMP was uh, under the multi-core association as, as a working group. Um, over time, so it grew, it grew a lot more repositories uh, than just RP message and remote pro. We now have different subgroups and we'll go through uh, them later uh, in details. Um, we also have created a bit more structure around the project. Um, so it's, it's normal to start small, but it, it's good to actually give a little bit of a structure to the collaboration uh, as you grow and you grow more members. So one of the first things we looked at a couple of years ago is to, uh, uh, to move OpenAMP under a proper foundation or a, an, an entity that could actually uh, represent OpenAMP, uh, something uh, along the line of an open source foundation, for instance. So we looked at the various options uh, and eventually we, we started uh, OpenAMP as a, we relaunched OpenAMP as a Linaro community project in September 2002. So Linaro community projects are fully open source uh, projects for collaboration, um, a bit like a Linux Foundation project. So they are different from Linaro as an organization that is a much larger, uh, is a much larger, larger organization. Uh, so you, anybody can really join a Linaro community project. Uh, you don't need to be a full Linaro member to do it, and you just need to uh, to join the, the project itself. 
uh, and it can be uh, the usually there is a very very small fee associated that it, it, you know that uh, usually anybody can afford. Um, uh, so the, the good the good about having Linaro uh, having open up as a as a Linaro community project. The good thing about it is now uh, we have a legal entity, so we can have a budget. Uh, so we can pay for testing if, if required. We can uh, we can have, we have a bit, a bit of money for, to pay for events, for locations, or for interns as needed. Um, aside from the um, entity. Um, the legal entity. The other thing that we start, we did when we relaunched the project, the Linaro Community Project, was to look at the governance. So I'm an open source guy, as many of you in the audience. Uh, so I I really uh, try uh, dislike, in a way, too much structure or too much uh, bureaucracy or red tape. But it's good to have in a project a tiny bit of uh, information and clarity and transparency on how the fundamental. Uh, processes work, such as in this case, how the budget get decided and allocated, who decides about the budget, or more importantly, actually, uh, the, the technical steering committee, who is part of the technical steering committee, what are the decisions that the TSC makes, um, or uh, as a contributor, how, you become, how do you become a, a maintainer? So these are the uh, very simple uh, questions that we answered in, uh, with, with, uh, with the governance that we introduced in uh, um, in September 2019. And really the idea is to make the process and the community transparent so that anybody can see uh, how it works and can join or uh, can become a maintainer or more more involved with the project uh, as, as they wish. Um, I should uh, say that uh, OpenAMP is also grew, as I mentioned, in sub-projects. In sub um, it did so, but it still stay, uh, stayed true to the core. So the mission of OpenAMP is really uh, creating uh, standard and interoperable interfaces so that multiple components on such a complex heterogeneous uh, system can work together and coordinate. And uh, all these projects are related in a way to, uh, to interfaces and standards, uh, including, uh, for instance, as to mention a couple of, of new ones, uh, the proxy operation uh, work that we are doing so that one uh, cluster can access files in the file system of another cluster definitely requires you know coordination and uh, uh, very stable ABIs and compatibility interfaces between between all these components. I'm gonna let uh, Natalie take it off from from here and uh, talk about uh, what the latest on that. Thanks, Stefano. So. Um Right now, um, with the OpenAMP project, we have um, some additional working groups, um, and they build upon the OpenAMP framework that we started off uh, with the multi-core association project with. Um, these are now uh, tackling problems that are related uh, to what OpenAMP um, framework started with. Um, and as Stefano mentioned, uh, we've sort of leveled up in maturity as an open source project. We now have official maintainer roles, the technical steering committee, the board, uh, the governance, um, the budget. And um, I think the part that uh, the group had the most fun with in the relaunch was uh, the logo. So as you can see, we have uh, two Ps in OpenAMP. Uh, they are different, so it's heterogeneous, and they are connected, um, and so they can communicate together. Uh, so what's really important, I think, is that uh, we have the very diverse member points of view uh, from a technical perspective. Um, so Although this is a Lenaro community project, as Stefano mentioned, um, it's not necessary to be a Lenaro member. Um, our members represent both ARM and non-ARM use cases. Uh, Linux, RTOS, and bare metal use cases are represented. Uh, use cases with high performance systems and resource constrained systems are represented. Um, 
And it's really great that the discussions are very focused on trying to solve technical challenges. So um, I'll go into a bit more detail about the OpenAMP project working group. Um, and what's really nice is uh, this is an effort by many companies, and so we have different companies leading the different working groups. So the OpenAMP RP working group is the one that focuses on the original parts of OpenAMP. So remote proc, RP message, vertio, and libmetal. Uh, the main repositories we've got are OpenAMP and libmetal, which just had a release in April. And then active work that's going on in this group is around um, big buffers, around improving testing through integration with Lava continuous integration. And Lenaro uh, has a Lava lab, uh, which is Lenaro automation and validation architecture. Um, that's what that stands for. Um, the group is working on getting patches upstreamed to the Linux remote proc mailing list for remote proc core. Um, and I guess the most notable um, recent um, event is that uh, some of the work on support for 64-bit L files uh, is now part of the 5.7 kernel release. Another working group that we have that is ramping up is the application services working group. So that is led by uh, Martin from Wind River. Oh, I forgot to mention uh, OpenAMP RP is uh, led by uh, Bill from PI. Uh, so for application services, um, they're focused on uh, what is needed to build on top of OpenAMP. Um, we got together in San Diego at Lenaro Connect last year in the fall and had a meeting and a call uh, with everybody who was interested. And the topics that were application developer issues that resonated most uh, with everyone who was in the discussion uh, was remote file access, so reading and writing files remotely, um, access, of a console, of a runtime remotely, proxy ports, and messaging APIs. So Wind River has been working in this area and taken inputs from the working group, and they are working to put together example code uh, that can be used as a starting point for more detailed discussions. Um, they're proposing that application services would use operating system drivers for console, socket, uh, file access, and networking from vert.io largely as is. Um, and then OpenAMP would provide the memory APIs, um, interprocessor interrupts, and remote proc, while vert.io would provide the runtime integration and collaboration using existing drivers and existing specification of the driver protocol, which would significantly accelerate development and also hopefully make adoption easier. And I'll hand it over to Stefano, who is the System Device Tree Working Group lead to tell you about the System Device Tree Working Group. One of the issues that uh, we have with, with such complex heterogeneous systems is that we need a way to describe it all in all its rich complexity and richness of resources. So the system device tree working group uh, aims at extending device tree to describe uh, such a complex system, such, a, such an heterogeneous system. Um, and the way we do it is uh, by adding the concept of multiple CPU cores, uh, multiple CPU clusters, and multiple views to device tree. So device tree, you probably know, is a, is a very commonly used standard uh, on a, in embedded uh, to describe uh, the hardware available and typically for one operating system. So one classic usage of uh, device tree is, uh, for instance, 
to be passed from the firmware from Ubu to Linux uh, to let Linux know what's available. The device is available, the, the, the number of CPU cores, etc. So we took the device tree and we looked very closely at it and we tried to extend it so that it's not just what the description of what Linux is, but it's a description of everything, including the Cortex-R cores, um, including uh, microblades, including anything that is on the platform. Um, in order to make this happen, uh, it, the, there were a few changes to uh, the device tree bindings, but very, I mean, not very uh, verbose in terms of change, but very meaningful because, as I mentioned, the device tree has, is typically a single view description. So it describes the system based on the view of one OS. Now, so the system device tree, we can describe the system with, with a multi view, um, in a view, multi view manner. So that each CPU cluster, for instance, we can describe, it can have a different uh, address mapping. So a device could be visible only by one cluster and not by the other. It could be routed in a way so that it's only reachable by one and not the other, or if it's reachable by both, it could be at different addresses. So these are the kind of uh, problems the system device is solving. There is another set of uh, problems that system device is tackling, and it's about uh, firmware and software configuration. So firmware and software configuration typically does not belong uh, to in, at large in, in device tree. There are some core pieces of it, so that they are there. And the one that uh, we are uh, working on are about resource assignments. So you, you can imagine that in a system with multiple clusters, you're going to have multiple operating systems, uh, each of them with running at maybe a different execution level of these clusters, and also they're going to have a bunch of memory that is their own. Uh, they're going to have some memory to communicate with others, share memory to interrupt, so to send messages across. Uh, they're going to have some devices uniquely assigned to them. Um, all these core configuration on basically what uh, the software running on a cluster can see, can access, and can use is what we call together an execution domain. So uh, in system device, we would define the execution domains available on, 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 on an SOC. So for instance, we define the execution domain running on the Cortex-R5 and the execution domain running, running on the Cortex-A. Um, and then we define which memory is private to both execution domains, so all, all you know, they, it's, it's their own to use, uh, and also the pages that are used for communication between the cluster. Uh, we also define the devices that are only accessible by one and not the other. Um, this, is, uh, this is really what System Device Tree as a specification is today, uh, but uh, System Device Tree is not just a spec, uh, is also, uh, there is also some code and tooling involved. Uh, and the main one is a tool called Lopper. Um, Lopper uh, is, is the English word for, you know, a gardening tool to chop and, uh, you, you know, a tree or uh, a bush, you know, to, 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 uh, to reduce uh, the amount of leaves that you have. Uh, so uh, it's, it's really, it was a word chosen for this tool because uh, the, the main goal of Lopper is to take a system device tree as input and chop it into different traditional device trees. So, so system device tree is useful as a description, even uh, at runtime, uh, to pass to an operating system, but it was really never the goal that operating system had to learn about system device tree because, well, why would a system device tree like Linux should know about what's running somewhere else that they cannot really access or have control over? I mean, useful information, but it's really not necessary. So since the beginning, one of the goals is to be backward compatible, so it's to be able to provide uh, as output from system device tree multiple traditional device trees. So the idea is you have a full description of the old platform with system device tree, then you can use Locker to um, cut it down, uh, to chop it to just a single device tree for one execution domain, the one you care about. So you can generate the device tree for Linux, you can generate the device tree for um, an Arthos, and you can generate uh, the device tree even for a Bermeter application. And then, of course, it uh, doesn't mean that one day the firmware like U-Boot 
or uh, Linux itself might benefit and learn and grow out, how to learn, you know, how to parse the system of IG and become aware of it. Um, so speaking of uh, our tosses, uh, one of the things that we are seeing is uh, that uh, system device and locker are, are being used to generate uh, a device tree, not for necessarily the runtime, but also for the build time of very small operating systems or per metal application. And the device tree is basically used in this case for configuring the build of the bare metal app so that then when it puts up, it already knows uh, all the addresses and, and what's available. Um, so the latest information on uh, system device tree is, uh, so we have, uh, we have um, a mini list, uh, we have uh, regular meetings, uh, we, are, and we are definitely welcome to join us if, if you're interested in this problem and in these solutions. Uh, so one of the things that we're looking at uh, is bus firewalls. So it's often the case, and it's the case on, on Zalin's board, and it's the case on other silicon vendors as well, uh, that you have um, tools to actually protect memory accesses from one cluster to the other, so that you, you can actually uh, prevent, uh, let's say, the cortex A from tampering with the device that was supposed to be uniquely assigned to the cortex A. Uh, for instance, on uh, um, on, on, on Zanin's board, this, this component is called XMPU. On other vendors, there are, uh, uh, there are a very rich ecosystem of these tools to be able to offer protection. Uh, so system device tree is really a natural fit for this kind of problem because it has already this concept of resource allocation to different clusters and different operating systems. So it's really natural to add protection uh, to this uh, information. And these are the bindings that we're working on right now together with ST Microelectronics, uh, coming up with a, a definition together and a proposal that we'll, uh, we'll show soon to the community. Hypervisor interfaces is another working group that we're going to start in the near future. Um, hypervisors, their main goal in Embedded is to uh, start multiple VMs and assign devices to, to virtual machine, maybe set up shared memory for communication. So as you can see, uh, the, the problem space is, is very similar to uh, AMP, to heterogeneous, uh, the heterogeneous computing. It's still about act, um, giving unique access to devices or setting up shared memory or uh, these, gen these, these kind of problems. So um, it's really fitting that OpenAMP is also looking at interfa common interfaces for hypervisors in embedded. Um, and what is, uh, let me go a little bit into the detail of what this working group is going to try to achieve. Um, it's getting more and more common for OpenSource project to uh, get used in more and more environment, vertical and markets that were never being used before. Some of them require safety certifications, such as you know, auto, automotive, and uh, <clears throat> avionics need safety certification for the software. Uh, so in Zen project, as well as other open source projects like Zephyr, uh, we're trying to work together making the open source software uh, more easily certifiable, providing more of the tools, the artifacts, the documents, the tests, uh, so that uh, users can take them and, 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 and do a certification if they wish to or if they have to. Um, so as part of these um, safety efforts, for instance, in the, in the case of Zen, uh, we have a special interest group called FUSA uh, Special Interest Group. Um, so we are trying to produce uh, a safety, uh, safety documents. So you should know that safety certifications have, the, have very high requirements uh, very on, on documentation of external interfaces. So this document needs to be incredibly precise, need to contain all the details on how these interfaces work. In fact, this document, they need to be so detailed that it's common practice in safety that uh, the team working on tests is expected to write a test just looking at the documents of the interfaces, never looking at the implementation, the implementation done by a different team altogether. So, this is really, when, when you look at this, this way, these documents are really incredibly detailed uh, interface documents. So there is no reason why uh, we cannot come together as a community uh, to uh, standardize uh, these interfaces, to work together on these documents 
so that they can be useful to everybody, not just Zen project, but other hypervisors, open source or proprietary. Uh, everybody could use them for safety or just as an interface documentation or even maybe just as a standard. So if we work together on this document and we use these interfaces you know, in different projects, then it becomes also easier uh, to have uh, uh, compatibility interfaces so to become natural, you can just become just one interface for everybody to work against, become easier to write software and guest uh, operating system running on this hypervisor on switching from one to the other. Um, proto prototyping with one open source hypervisor, switching later maybe uh, to a proprietary hypervisor, for instance. I think with that, I'm going to uh, leave it to uh, Natalie to continue on uh, examples of open up in the industry. So we have a couple of slides coming up of all the ways that different companies are using and have contributed to OpenAMP. And what this will go to show is how we're really solving um, problems that are important in industry and that benefit from standardization uh, and collaboration uh, by multiple companies um, that have a variety of use cases. Um, and it shows the active involvement of the member companies in the project and in using OpenAMP. So at Xilinx, uh, OpenAMP is the default AMP solution for Zinc 7000, Zinc Ultrascale Plus MPSOC, and virtual devices. Um, these devices have a Cortex-A application processor unit, and uh, MPSOC and virtual devices have a Cortex-R uh, real-time processor unit. Uh, so APU and RPU, which Stefano mentioned uh, earlier in the talk. Um, and so uh, either APU or RPU can act as master. Um, and as Stefano mentioned earlier, we also have Microblaze soft processors that can go in the FPGA fabric. Uh, so there's also uh, Microblaze OpenAMP support. Um, Mentor Graphics, uh, they use OpenAMP as the core for the Mentor Embedded Multi-Core Framework and Multi-Core Framework CERT product offerings. They expand upon uh, OpenAMP by adding functionality to support Linux as a remote, large buffer support, zero copy, proxy support for Ethernet, and additional development tools. And uh, they also created a version that is focused on mixed safety criticality systems where Mentor embedded multi-core framework cert handles the communications between the safe and non-safe domains on a single MPSOC. TI has been working in the OpenAMP project to enhance the Linux kernel implementation of remote proc and RP message, to define the wire protocol between processors, and has contributed a limited scope version of remote proc loader into U-Boot to handle starting auxiliary cores before main Linux start. TI uses OpenAMP uh, the OpenAMP implementation for RTOS and for bare metal environments as an interoperability reference for its own implementation. CalRay leverages OpenAMP capabilities as a standard message passing solution within its homogeneous mini core architecture on MPPA3 processor. Uh, this support works across multiple systems uh, when MPPA3 is used as an accelerator using VertIO over PCIe, uh, as well as inside the processor itself using VertIO with shared memory. The Zephyr uh, RTOS open source project has a general integration to make OpenAMP available. Nordic Semiconductor has an example in Zephyr 
where they use OpenAMP to provide a Bluetooth host controller interface so that within a single SOC, uh, the application core can run the Bluetooth host and interact with the network core running the Bluetooth controller. Lenaro hosts the OpenAMP project through their Lenaro Community Projects Division. And some areas that their engineers are involved are uh, through Zephyr, through the OpenAMP RP working group, and through the lava testing. ST Microelectronics integrates OpenAMP uh, in its multi-core and multi-SOC, STM32 solutions for interprocessor communication between OpenAMP to OpenAMP or Linux RP message to OpenAMP. And ST uses the OpenAMP library with lib with bare metal, sorry, um, with free RTOS and with Zephyr. Wind River provides OpenAMP and participates in the OpenAMP working groups to accelerate the ability of developers to create edge compute applications. And ARM has played an active role in the discussions to shape the system device tree proposal uh, that Stefano talked about earlier. So where can you learn more and how can you get involved? We have a GitHub project. So if you go to github.com slash OpenAMP, um, you can check out what we've got there. Uh, also, uh, Stefano mentioned Lopper. So Lopper lives at devicetree.org's uh, GitHub. We have an OpenAMP wiki. Um, if you go there, you can check out the notes from previous calls. And there's information about features that are being worked on and features that are under consideration for future work. We have a community project website um, and we have mailing lists. So Stefano had mentioned the mailing lists. Um, we welcome everyone to sign up. You can go to lists.openampproject.org. We have calls for the technical steering committee and the working groups. The call invitations are sent to the mailing list. So if you're interested, uh, do sign up for the mailing list. Uh, right now, the one that is meeting most frequently is the OpenAMP RP working group. They meet every two weeks. Um, and then the other uh, groups, TSC and board, uh, meet sort of as necessary. Uh, we welcome participation. Um, it's not necessary to be from an OpenAMP project member company. Um, do please check us out. Uh, and after you get to know more about the project and what we're working on, if your company wants to become an OpenAMP project member, um, it's not necessary to be a, Len a Lenaro project member company. Um, the member fees support administration for the project and infrastructure. And uh, what membership would get each company is a vote on the technical steering committee and a vote on the board. So um, as Stefano mentioned, we wanted to make becoming a member company really as easy as possible. So all you would have to do is have a company representative sign the membership agreement in charter. Uh, there's a $2,500 annual fee. And um, this is our list of current member companies. So we have ARM, Calray, Lenaro, Mentor, Nordic, ST, TI, Wind River, and Xilinx. And uh, hopefully soon uh, we will have um, a 10th member company that's in the works. And um, I just wanted to also thank everyone from the member companies who contributed some information um, towards this project.
and uh, these slides. Hi, if, if you have any questions, is this the right time to ask them? We will be very happy to uh, take any questions and answer them. I can see that we have the first question already. Um, the question is about uh, the status of large buffer transfer. So I don't know the very latest and we'll have to get back to you on that, on, uh, maybe on the Slack channel after the, um, after the talk. Um, uh, I do know that there was a demo showed uh, based on pre-shared memory um, and um, it was not then zero copy per se. Um, and I can tell, I can also get back to you on whether it was using DMA buff. I think it's probable that it was using DMA buff on the Linux side. So. Any other questions on uh, any of the topics? I guess while we are waiting for uh, any other questions to come in, um, I just want to mention that the Open Amp RP working group um, they have their next call scheduled for tomorrow morning at um, 8 a.m. Pacific. Um, I guess if anyone is interested in joining that, um, ping me on Slack and I'll forward you the invitation. Um, the, uh, so, hi, Francisco. Um, so there is a question on whether Xen will parse system device tree. And that, that's a good question. And yes, so Xen should parse system device tree. So one of the goals of system device trees, in fact, is to make the configuration of an AMP system um, small, I mean, similar and aligned with the configuration of a static hypervisor. Uh, so especially the static configuration of Xen with DOM zero less and guests that are predefined should work with system device tree. Same way the configuration of an AMP system will will be done with, with system device tree. So for that to happen, Xen needs to parse system device tree to understand the virtual machine that it needs to start. Uh, and you should also know that the, the DOM zero less uh, work so that the, the device tree configuration for Xen to start multiple VM in parallel is already in a way a precursor of system device tree because it's following many of the same principles and idea. Uh, so it's not um, by the letter of system device tree yet. So it will need some improvement and adaptation to support official device tree. Um, does OpenAM suffer from the share cache issue Zen solved with cache colony? So that's a that's another very good question. Um, so it yes, whenever there is a share cache, and typically uh, when OpenAM is used, uh, what maybe the most classic scenario is between a Cortex R and the Cortex A cluster, or between a Cortex M and a Cortex A cluster, and there is no share cache in this share, in these cases. Um, so uh, the shared L2 cache that can be a source of interference inside a single cluster, it will not be present in that case. However, if you're using OpenAMP to communicate between two virtual machines uh, on the same Cortex-A cluster that has a shared L2 cache, then yes, uh, the cache interference issue uh, that cache coloring is addressing will be present. Um, so question from Matthew, uh, if there's any support for multiple processors uh, or marking controllers working on the same board, but not on the same processor die. Uh, so ST um, uses OpenAMP for their uh, multi SOC solutions. So um, I guess the answer would be yes. Uh, a question from Andy. Uh, I like the question. Uh, when you have a system device tree, what do you pass the data structure to if there is nothing running? That, that's a good question. Um, so, well, the, with the premise that one day there might be a runtime usage of system device tree, with then the data structure be passed the same way the device tree is passed. So today is mostly using beforehand. That would be a build time. Uh, so you pass system device tree to Lopper that will then uh, generate normal device tree out of it. And the normal device trees are passed as usual to uh, Linux at runtime, or for instance, 
at um, uh, an Arthos build system that will consume it at build time. There are firmware, however, for instance, you know, an overall monitor of a platform uh, that uh, could consume system device three at runtime today, uh, because this is one of the few components that actually needs a description of everything that's present on the platform. So that would be a, an example of something that could um, use system device three right now. Any other questions from the audience? So uh, a question from Drew. Um, so in BeagleBoard, um, uh, I am interested in different cores, how do they communicate with Linux? Uh, so the communication side of OpenAMP, it's, um, uh, it's typically solved by setting up shared memory uh, between uh, the, um, let's say the small core, a Cortex-R or Cortex-M and the Cortex-A core. Uh, the memory is pre-shared beforehand as system configuration. Um, also, uh, where there is also an effort going on in trying to make it more dynamic and flexible. Uh, so, so the mention of viewboot. So, you know, um, OpenAMP is looking at uh, a number of uh, interfaces that are useful on, in an AMP system. So, I'm. So probably U-Boot will not uh, use a, a ring to communicate with the Cortex-R, for instance. It's not really typically needed, uh, but um, it might consume system device tree. So system device tree is likely gonna be passed to U-Boot because in case of hypervisors or, or uh, for that kind of static configuration when there are multiple entities, then U-Boot need to be involved. Uh, you want to pass a richer description of the system and U-Boot is a typical, um, one of the typical component that would need it. Any last question? We still have a couple of minutes if you have any other doubts or question or comments? And I guess if you think of any um, after the talk, uh, you can at mention us in the Slack channel that was uh, popped up on your screen a short while ago. Okay, I guess, uh, Thank you everyone for uh, joining our call today and um, see you on the Slack. Have a great day.